Hello everyone and welcome to Worship Today, the 11th of September. My name is Bill Henderson, I'm a reader in the Church of Scotland and I hope you will enjoy and feel blessed by our time together today. Sadly, we start today with a tribute to Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth, who died on Thursday. Today's service was recorded before the news of her death was announced and I'd like to apologise in advance, first of all, and seek your forgiveness if the late edits leave things seeming a little disjointed. Although she was 96, the Queen did not appear to be especially unwell, and I think her death has come as a surprise and a shock to many of us. The moderator of the Church of Scotland, the Right Reverend Ian Greenshields, has provided a video with his thoughts and prayer on this sad occasion, which we can now hear. I recently had the privilege and honour of staying at Balmoral and spending time with Her Majesty the Queen. She was in good spirits, full of fun and strong in faith, a genuinely remarkable lady. This is a time of grief and thanksgiving for a life well and purposefully lived. Her family are in pain and sorrow, and I know they will value our prayers for them. Let us pray. Gracious and good Father, full of love and peace, you are from everlasting to everlasting, ever good and ever true. Your greatest gift to us is eternal life, and in this hope we place our trust. Today we give thanks for the life of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth, who has now entered fully into the promise in which she believed. Long has she reigned over us, offering support and courage, a steadying hand in difficult days and a kindly presence in times of peace and prosperity. We thank you for our life, so rich in years and in service, for our unwavering commitment to country, commonwealth and every generation. For our trust in Jesus Christ, our devotion to the church and our respect for other faiths, receive our thanks today. May she rest in peace as she enters fully into your promise. In their loss, comfort our family, especially our King as he assumes his new responsibilities. Assure them of your presence and peace, granting to them the consolation of cherished memories and the hope of your promised kingdom. And these prayers we offer in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. So, it is a very sad week, although it is one that we all knew had to happen sometime. Ironically, the last time I was uh, at Moncrief was at Pentecost, which coincided with the Queen's Platinum Jubilee weekend. And after the in-person service, the congregation laid on a great spread and the young people kept plying me with cakes. And I think I've still got some of the cakes built into my waistline, but I did enjoy it, so thank you for that. But I'm delighted to be back with you again today at the other end of the summer. If you've been away, I hope you had a good trip. And even if you haven't, I hope you have been able to find some time to relax. Today's readings are from Psalm 51, Exodus 32, and 1 Timothy chapter 1, if you want to get your Bibles ready to read along. Sarah is on study leave this week, so hopefully she will come back refreshed and with some new ideas or with new thoughts about things. It is very important for all of us involved in ministry to keep up to date, and a period of study leave is just one of the ways in which we can do that. Our call to worship today comes from Psalm 51, verses 10, 12 and 13. 
It is believed that this psalm was written by King David in response to Nathan confronting David over his adultery with Bathsheba. Create a pure heart in me, O God, and put a new and loyal spirit in me. Give me again the joy that comes from your salvation and make me willing to obey you. Then I will teach sinners your commands and they will turn back to you. Amen. And in the Bible reading that we're going to have from 1 Timothy, Paul describes God as immortal and invisible. So let's open our singing today with number 132 in CH4, Immortal, Invisible, God Only Wise. now approach God in prayer. Let us pray. Loving God, we come before you today knowing your greatness and our frailty. We come before you knowing that we know so little of you, yet you know all about us. You know our strengths and our weaknesses. You know our thoughts. You know the words we will speak before we have even drawn breath. To you, O Lord, we must seem like a tiny ant on a wide boulevard, and yet you know each of us by name. You know our thoughts, and you know our hearts. Even worse, Lord, you know our faults. You know the sins we will commit before we do. We deserve 
to have you stand on us and crush us like that ant on a pavement. And yet you are a merciful God, slow to anger and quick to forgive. We thank you, Lord. We praise you for your goodness and your mercy. Creator God, your glory is all around us. We see you in the trees, in the birds, in the flowers. We see you in the sun in daytime and we see you in the countless stars at night time. We have great scientists who can do no more than teach us the greatness of your creation. They cannot explain how you did it. Such is your wonder, such is your perfection, and for that we praise you. And yet, despite your glory, Lord God, we do wrong. We hurt other people, and we forget that in hurting other people we are actually hurting you. We hurt you, loving God, you who sent your own Son to teach us to love you and to love one another. We confess that we are slow to learn, that we react in anger, that patience is far from us. We confess that we know that Jesus taught us that the last shall be first, and yet we still always want to win. Despite all our failings, Lord, you still love us, even though we cannot understand such love. Loving God, when we are hypocritical, teach us sincerity. When we tell lies, teach us your truth. When we are stupid, teach us your wisdom. When we do wrong, forgive us our errors. Please help us, Lord, to say like King David, create a pure heart in me, O God, and put a new and loyal spirit in me. With our new hearts and new loyal spirits, please allow us to approach you now. Please accept our worship of you now, small and insignificant as we are. Let our worship be fitting and acceptable in your sight, loving God. We ask this in Jesus' name, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Now, I don't know what any of your houses look like. I can take some guess, guesses at them. I'm going to guess that you've probably got a bathroom. I'm going to guess that you've probably got at least one bedroom. A lot of houses have got more than one. I'm going to guess that you've got a kitchen. Maybe you've got a separate living room or maybe your kitchen is the same as your living room. It's part of the same room. I don't know that. And houses are all different and all got different things. One of the things that my house has got and I'm sitting on it at the moment is a naughty step. I don't know if any of your houses have got a naughty step. And if you do, I hope it doesn't get used very much. Mine doesn't, I'm pleased to say. But sometimes one of my grandsons does have to sit on it, but not very often. But I heard a story about a house that does not have a naughty step. Instead, it's got a naughty corner. And this was a dull, musty, horrible corner that no one really bothered with. It wasn't a nice place to be in. The house belonged to an old man who was a granddad just like me. His granddaughter was called Mary 
and she was very cheeky and sometimes quite rude. One time when she came to visit, she was especially bad. At tea time, she screamed, I hate broccoli and threw her plate right across the room so her dinner ran down the wall and made a terrible mess. Her mummy was furious and Mary was sent to the naughty corner while the grown-ups cleared up the mess. Then Mary was sent straight to bed, hungry because she'd thrown her food away. Mary was very, very sorry. In the morning when she woke up, she was a bit nervous that she might still be in trouble. She came downstairs quietly and went to find her grandad to tell him that she was sorry. That's all right, said grandad. You were very bad last night, but that was yesterday. Today is a new day and you have been forgiven. What do you mean? Mary asked. Come with me, said Grandad, and taking her hand, he led her to the naughty corner. Except it wasn't the naughty corner any more. Grandad was an artist, and overnight he had painted the naughty corner and changed it into a cosy corner for My Little Pony, which was Mary's favourite toy, and he'd put some of Mary's books in it too. Mary knew then that her grandad had truly forgiven her and that her grandad loved her very much. There was still a bit of a food stain on the wall as a reminder of what she'd done. But somehow, even that didn't seem to matter any more. And let's have a song now about forgiveness. Uh, it's number 528 in CH4. Make me a channel of your peace. Today's Bible readings come from Exodus 
chapter 32, verses 7 to 14, and 1 Timothy, chapter 1, verses 12 to 17. And Anne McKinnon is going to read that for us. Thank you. Exodus, chapter 32, verses 7 to 14. The Lord said to Moses, Hurry and go back down, because your people whom you led out of Egypt have sinned and rejected me. They have already left the way that I commanded them to follow. They have made a bull calf out of melted gold and have worshipped it and offered sacrifices to it. They are saying that this is their God who led them out of Egypt. I know how stubborn these people are. Now don't try to stop me. I am angry with them and I am going to destroy them. Then I will make you and your descendants into a great nation. But Moses pleaded with the Lord his God and said, Lord, why should you be so angry with your people whom you rescued from Egypt with great might and power? Why should the Egyptians be able to say that you led your people out of Egypt, planning to kill them in the mountains and destroy them completely? Stop being angry. Change your mind and do not bring this disaster on your people. Remember your servants Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. Remember the solemn promise you made to them to give them as many descendants as there are stars in the sky and to give their descendants all that land you promised would be their possession forever. So the Lord changed his mind and did not bring on his people the disaster he had threatened. Amen. First Timothy chapter 1 verses 12 to 17. I give thanks to Christ Jesus our Lord who has given me strength for my work. I thank him for considering me worthy and appointing me to serve him, even though in the past I spoke evil of him and persecuted and insulted him. But God was merciful to me because I did not yet have faith and so did not know what I was doing. And our Lord poured out his abundance grace on me and gave me the faith and love which are ours in union with Christ Jesus. This is a true saying, to be complete, completely accepted and believed. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. I am the worst of them. But God was merciful to me in order that Christ Jesus might show his full patience in dealing with me, the worst of sinners, as an example for all those who would later believe in him and receive eternal life. To the eternal King, immortal and invisible, the only God, to him be honour and glory forever and ever. Amen. There's a thing I've often noticed in the Old Testament I don't know if you've seen this as well or if you've wondered about it. And it's the number of times when we are told that all of the people or the whole nation did something or other. I first noticed this, I think, in the books of Ezra and Nehemiah after the rebuilding of the temple when all of the people gathered and they all agreed to follow the way of the Lord. And that agreement included some pretty brutal actions, such as the men separating themselves from their foreign wives. I think it was reading that story that first caught my attention and maybe made me wonder about how the people felt, how wholehearted they were to this obedience, and whether in fact they actually all did what was required of them. In a human sense, that particular story is quite heartbreaking and that might be why it's stuck in my mind. But in many places in the Old Testament, we see the Israelite nation acting as one body or one mind. You are a stiff-necked people, is a recurrent description. And what I'm getting at here is there seem to be no, or at least very little, room for individual differences. Once the mass meeting had decided what would happen, 
Individuals who didn't like it basically had the choice to either fall in line or leave the community. And indeed, if you read on in the story of, in the story of Nehemiah, you'll see that some people did make that choice. But at the time of the Exodus, leaving the community wasn't even an option. They were travelling through a desert. The community gathered manna and quails. The leaders of the community got God to give them water out of the stones. If any individual wanted to go their own way outside the community, how would they eat? What would they drink? And even the leaders weren't immune to this pressure. In the lead up to today's story, Moses had climbed Mount Sinai, where God was giving him detailed instructions that Moses was to convey to the people. Moses was up the hill with God for 40 days, and in that time the people grew impatient and persuaded Aaron, who was Moses' brother and co-leader of the Israelites, to make a gold bull calf. And we picked up the story today with God sending Moses back down to sort them out. God will destroy his people and make a great new nation descended from Moses. Not for the first time. Moses pleads with God on behalf of the people. And did you see the huge personal sacrifice that Moses made? God has offered to make Moses the father of the great nation, effectively replacing Abraham. We all, every one of us, wants what's best for our children. But here Moses pleads with God to not do that for Moses personally or for Moses' children. God's covenant with Abraham, with Isaac and with Jacob must not be broken, for God's reputation is at stake. So Moses sets aside his own advantage in order to protect God's perfection. And God relented and did not completely destroy his people, although if you read on from today's reading, you will see that they didn't escape punishment either. However, Moses was also able to get God's forgiveness for at least some of the people. And this stands rather in contrast to Paul writing to Timothy. Paul had unwittingly acted against God, but had obtained forgiveness through Jesus Christ. This was an entirely personal affair. Paul had sinned, and it was Paul who was forgiven. It was Paul who was, as he tells us, the worst of sinners, who spoke evil, who persecuted and insulted. These were done by Paul personally, albeit with the full support of the Jewish authorities. Paul's forgiveness was personal. I don't doubt that Paul prayed for the Jewish authorities to see their error and to come to Christ. But the point here is that Paul's own forgiveness was personal and not corporate. There's a kind of oversimplification of Christianity and the role of Jesus Christ in comparison to Judaism. The Jews had a system of sacrifices by which they could atone for their sins. Jesus, through his death and resurrection, is often presented as the ultimate sacrifice, the ultimate atonement for all of our sins. And that, indeed, is true as the, the book of Hebrews makes clear. But it is not the whole story. Because behind the Jewish thinking of sacrifice are two ideals, which we do well to understand. One is that sacrificial atonement only works for accidental or unwitting sin. The other is that atonement requires genuine remorse or repentance. Now, Jesus made clear, when he forgave the criminal on the cross, 
that these two ideals are no more than ideals and that he is able and willing to forgive in all circumstances. Equally, we should still do our best to avoid acting badly. And when we do act badly, to truly regret and to apologise for our actions. Paul certainly felt those things acutely, as this letter reminds us. Paul's sin in persecuting the early Christians was accidental. He genuinely believed that he was doing the right thing. And after his conversion, his regret and remorse were equally genuine. But where do other people fit in? What can we learn from Paul that we should apply to our dealings with others? If we think back to the circumstances of Paul's conversion, he was blinded while travelling to Damascus in order to persecute Christians there. In Damascus, the Christian Ananias opened his eyes and called him brother. Then, on his return to Jerusalem, the Christian church there was understandably suspicious of him, but Barnabas came to his rescue. Think of the impact that Paul was going to go on to have, and you can see that these two small acts by Ananias and Barnabas were in fact world-changing. We may think that we as individuals, can't really make much of a difference. But the story of Paul's conversion shows that whatever little good we do multiplies many times when God gets hold of it. There's an expression you will know, which is to forgive and forget. And Paul does his utmost to ensure that in the forgiveness he has received, that the memory of what he did will never be forgotten. He never forgot that he was forgiven and he never allowed himself to forget why he needed to be forgiven. Paul, even in his own life, was a famous and influential man. He was a man who met with kings and governors who came close to meeting the emperor. By always remembering by writing down the bad things he had done, Paul tried to ensure that he never became proud of his own position or achievements. He didn't become big-headed. He tried to ensure that the credit for whatever he did, whatever he achieved, was given to God and to Jesus. The memory of his faults and of his forgiveness served both to maintain his trust in God and to spur him on to greater efforts. Paul wrote a lot of letters, many of which have been lost. Paul travelled widely, establishing churches as he went. And I find it ironic that, as he did all this work, he taught a theology of salvation through grace, not works. Paul's memory of his forgiveness was the spur to share the good news of Christ's forgiveness with as many people as he could. In turn, that should inspire us to share that same good news with as many people as we can. Paul is almost saying, if someone as bad as me can be saved, there is hope for everyone. And indeed, there is. But the final thing I want to take out of this reading is the reason for Paul's confidence. Paul was confident because Jesus had chosen him and had trusted him. And it is very difficult to trust someone who has wronged you, and yet that is what Jesus did to Paul. If you think back to the story I told you earlier about Mary and the naughty corner, you can see that Mary's granddad trusted Mary. He trusted that by showing Mary love, he wouldn't need to use the naughty corner again. Jesus did the same with Paul. Jesus' forgiveness of Paul was not just in words, it was from the heart. Paul knows that, because Jesus also empowered him 
to do all the great works that he did. Paul writes that he received this forgiveness so that he could be an example to all of us who come after him. And that is an important thought for us to carry with us. If Jesus can forgive Paul, he can forgive us. We're all here today, the people watching online and the people present in the church, because God has chosen us. We're all here because Jesus wants us to ask his forgiveness for the bad things we have done. And we're all here because Jesus wants to empower us to spread his good news to everyone we meet. Unlike in the Old Testament, we're all treated as individuals. Through Jesus Christ, our forgiveness is personal. We can all have our own relationship with God through Jesus Christ. Indeed, Jesus wants us all to have that relationship with him and to tell everyone else about it. Amen. Let's pray. Caring God, thank you for your word to us. Thank you that you are a God of forgiveness. Thank you that you forgave the Israelites. Thank you that you forgave Paul. And thank you that you're willing to forgive us. Lord God, we are indeed in need of forgiveness. Yes, we like to think our sins are accidental, but still we hurt other people. We damage your world, and through these things we hurt you. Please forgive us for all the bad things we do. But also, loving God, teach us how to forgive the people who hurt us. Teach us how to forgive as you forgive us. Help us to trust people who have wronged us. Help us to strengthen them so they learn to do the right thing. Help us, Lord, to help others to come to know you. For we know you want everyone to know you and to love you. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. And our next song is by John Newton, a man who, like Paul, also experienced more than his fair share of God's grace, and who, like Paul, never forgot his sinful past as a slave trader. Number 555 in CH4, Amazing Grace.
will now dedicate our offerings and pray for our world. Let us pray. Graceful God, we come before you today as your holy people, weak and sinful as we are. We thank you that, through your Son, you do forgive us. We thank you that you love us. We thank you that you ask so little of us. Lord God, you ask us to forgive others as you forgive us, and yet we find even that difficult to do. You ask us to love others as you love us, and we also find that difficult to do. Lord God, you ask so little, and even that we struggle with. We do present before you our offerings, offerings of time, of talents and of money, little as they are. We ask you to accept these, to bless these, to multiply these and to lead us to use these to grow and to develop your kingdom on earth. And we bring before you today our troubled world and our cares and worries for it. We bring before you war and violence, in almost all cases caused by human greed. Greed for money, greed for power, greed for status. Always, Lord, it seems that the poor and the powerless are first victims. Please reach out to them in comfort and protection and reach out to the perpetrators of such acts that they might see the error of their ways and pull back in love and respect for their fellow human beings. We remember especially today the events of 21 years ago, known as 9-11, when terrorists attacked the USA, killing thousands of people. Many people still carry the scars of that terrible day. We all suffer reduced freedom as the authorities seek to avoid repeat incidents. Please help to comfort the suffering. Please help to keep people safe without curtailing our freedoms. And, forgiving God, please help all who suffer to truly forgive those who have hurt them. We pray for the United Kingdom with its new Prime Minister appointed this week. Please help her to act according to your wishes and not according to her own greed or ambition or the greed of her close circle of contacts. Please help her to always act out of love and to set an example of caring for the people of this country and the people of other countries. Please guide all of our politicians to act in the interests of fairness and justice for all. Creator God, you gave us weather and seasons as we feel the weather change and see autumn approach, we look forward to the warm colours of the changing leaves. But we also look forward in fear of our energy bills as we try to keep warm. Please help us to act sensibly and help our government to act to help the many people needing support and also to enact policies which will lead to reductions in the cost of energy. Loving God, you teach us to love and you want us to love. We give thanks for all those people who act in love to care for others. We give thanks for staff in the health services, in personal care, in hospices and in the emergency services. These are people who act out of love whether they profess any faith or not and we give thanks for that and ask your blessing on them. Living God, we give thanks for people involved in medical research and in health improvement programmes. In this country, we rarely see some diseases, but elsewhere in your world, diseases like malaria, cholera and leprosy still bring misery to millions. Bless those people trying to find cures, treatments preventions for all these diseases and bless too the nursing and other staff involved in care of the people 
who are sick with these ailments of which we know little in this country. Caring God, we especially seek your blessing and comfort for the bereaved, for people suffering the loss of a loved one. There are no words we can say to ease the pain. All we can do is to sit quietly and let your comforting arms enfold the bereaved. Today we think especially of the royal family who have lost a much loved mother, grandmother, great grandmother and aunt. We beg your support for King Charles, obliged to carry out public duties while mourning his mother. Her Majesty was a much loved national and international leader and millions of people in this country and around the world feel saddened at her death. But we also think of ordinary people suffering their own bereavements this week, whose pain is just as acute, but who might feel overlooked amongst the national mourning. Loving God, Jesus promised that you would comfort all those who mourn. Please do that today and this week for all who are grieving a loved one. Gracious God, we look forward to the coming week. Please be with us. Please take care of us and please lead us to always act in love, following your will. We ask all this in the name of your risen Son, Jesus Christ. Amen.
thank you for tuning in and thank you for sticking with us until the end of the recording. Uh, I'm due back next month and I'm looking forward to that and, and I hope you are as well and I haven't put you off and that you will tune in again and of course tune in again each week uh, for the uh, for Sarah and for other preachers that she may have. Uh, this might surprise you but I'd like to finish with a, a slightly amended saying of the Islamic prophet Muhammad who said, if you go an inch towards God, God will come a yard towards you. If you go a yard towards God, God will come a furlong towards you. But for now, I wish you the Lord's peace and that God may give you every good thing and may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you, all whom you love, and with all whom you find it difficult to love, now and forevermore. Amen. <laughs>